So great to see you all this morning. I'm glad that you're here. I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. I'm glad that you can be a part of our final week of the Art of Adulting. This is week five. I hope you uh, have enjoyed this series. Our goal is for it to be helpful and hopeful every time uh, we, we give a message. And uh, today, as we land the plane on this series, we're going to talk about how wisdom intersects with marriage. And uh, even if you're not married, I think you're going to find some things that are really helpful for you today. But we're going to talk about wisdom. We're going to talk about marriage. And, and listen, I'm no different from you. When I need wisdom, I go to the same place you go to, the internet. Um, and so I wanted to see what are people online saying about marriage. I found some social media posts from some married couples. Me, look, I love you, but I made exactly the amount of cheese and crackers I want to eat right now. But I only, the exact amount. How about this one? Relationship status, my wife asked me what I wanted for dinner and then told me I was wrong. And, uh, I love this one. This is so me. I was just about to do that chore. I see you're starting now. It's marriage. Here's the last one. Headed to Goodwill to buy back something I donated yesterday because this is my lesson on why communication and marriage is so important. <laughs> marriage is great. Marriage is a, great, uh, is a gift of God. There is nothing wrong with marriage. And yet... There are sometimes things that go wrong with marriages. There can be problems in marriage. And today I've got good news for you and I got some bad news, but I want to start off with some good news. I got good news for you. Regardless of the level of conflict and adversity that you are experiencing, this is good news. You did not marry the wrong person. If you're sitting next to, the, to your spouse, I want you to turn and look at them right now. Have a moment. You just say, you, I didn't marry the wrong person. All right? I got bad news. Your spouse married the wrong person. All right? I don't know how you did it, but you did. You got, them to, you got this amazing person to say no to everybody else on the planet so say, they can say yes to you. You got game. Right? You got this amazing, wonderful person to hitch their life to someone who is deeply flawed and deeply sinful. You got game. Way to go. You did it. Now, your sin, that's bad news, but there is good news. Our series thesis, Love Atones for Sin, Wisdom Avoids It. There is an answer to the problems and the moral mess-ups we bring to our relationships. And this is based on our theme verse. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Remember, this means missing the mark. The weight and the depth of our sin, the debt for our sin is paid for by Jesus. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. And there is deep, deep riches for all of us in this verse. I don't think you can get to the bottom. You could try, but I don't think you could get to the bottom of the goodness that's being talked about here. And we need the riches of this. Let me just tell you a little bit of something I've discovered about me. Maybe you can relate. The more intentional I become at trying to be a loving person, the more aware I become of how I miss the mark. Can anybody relate to that? Like who is more aware of how deep their selfishness goes. The person who never tries to serve others or the person who does. Who is more aware of how deep their greed goes? The person who never engages in generosity or the person who does. Who is more aware of how deep their pride goes? The person who never elevates the needs of others above their own or the person who does. This is an irony of life that I've discovered. This is about me. The better of a person I try to be, the worse of a person I discover that I am. So we're just going to do a little survey. This is an all skate. Everybody gets to participate in this one. I'm going to ask you a question. You raise your hand if it's true, and you keep your hand up. All right, are you guys ready to do this? All right. Who in here, and you can play along at home, who in here, you've served somebody, even though on the inside you did not want to? All right, I'm looking around. Who in here, keep them up. Who in here, you did something generous, even on the inside, you didn't want to. Who in here, you have wrestled down the greed monster, you have wrestled down the pride monster inside of yourself so that you could respond with grace and kindness. Anybody ever done that? All right, put your hands down. That is great. Thank you. Now, on one hand, I could totally understand. I totally understand the narrative that somebody would say, I am a good person because I said no to these lesser impulses so that I could say yes to something better. I totally get that. But it begs the question, why were those ugly desires in you to begin with? Like, why do we have to have a wrestling match between selfishness and serving? 
between greed and generosity, between pride and humility. This is what Proverbs says to us. Who can say? Who can say I've kept my heart pure? I am clean and without sin. If your hand was just up, and we all saw you, if your hand was just up, this should stun us. This should grip us. This should push us to humility and repentance. It should send us running back to our theme verse. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through the love and the faithfulness of Jesus, the weight and the severity and the depth and the debt of our sin has been paid for so that we can be free. And today, we're going to try and maybe drop a couple of truth bombs. I think it's going to be good for everybody. Even if you're not married, we're going to talk about marriage, but even if you're not married, I think it's going to be good for you too. So regardless of your relationship status, and also regardless of your spiritual background, if you're a, if you're a devoted person or you're a doubter, this is going to be good for you too. And yet, this is the on-ramp to wisdom. And fear of the Lord doesn't mean being scared of God. It means being in awe of and revering Jesus. And if you were to say, I don't believe in Jesus, I don't know if I trust this whole Jesus thing, you can take the wisdom we're going to talk about, you can apply it as techniques and tactics for your marriage, for your relationship, and if you do, your relationship will get better. But the thing you're going to discover is that internal wrestling match and missing the mark never goes away. And the kind of stuff that we're going to talk about today It only comes from first being loved by Jesus so that we can then love like Jesus. It is the product of knowing him and being loved by him. We have to know him and be loved by him and be connected to him to be able to do this. Proverbs 3.3 says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. This word right here, This is a deep and very dense word. It's a word that's difficult to translate into English, not because we don't know what it means. We know exactly what it means. There's just not an English word that can really contain the depth of this word. And if you've ever studied other languages, you know that sometimes that's just the case. There's a word in another language. It doesn't fit neat and tidy in an English word. A couple of years ago, when I discovered that I was moving to the frozen north, which is Minnesota, I started doing some digging. I learned this Norwegian word. There's other words like it, but I think it's pronounced cozily, and it means the kind of warmth and coziness you only experience when it's crazy cold outside. And it also means the kind of warmth that you experience when you're deeply connected to other people. And there's just not an English equivalent to it. It's the same way with this word. And so biblical scholars and translators, they take this Hebrew word, and sometimes they translate it as love. Sometimes they translate it as faithfulness. And sometimes they translate it as loving kindness or kindness. And whichever word you pick, you're not wrong. Because this is such a big and marvelous and deep and rich word. And in Hebrew, the word sounds like this. Chesed. And it's the way that Jesus loves us. And the way that we experience this word is like this. We experience it as undeserved kindness. It's sacrificial. It's the kind of kindness or love or faithfulness that comes with great cost to the giver and is great gain for the receiver. Throughout this series, we're talking about wisdom. A theme that I hope you've picked up on is that to be a wise person is a person who makes pre-decisions. You just pre-decide. This verse is about making pre-decisions. Take this, bind it to yourself. Write it on the tablet of your heart. Carve it on the core of who you are. Will you pre-decide that you are going with this regardless of the kind of situations you're in? Will you pre-decide to go with loving kindness? We can visualize it like this. Anytime we intersect conflict, anytime we intersect with adversity, we can go with kindness or we can go with contempt. It's as simple as this, kindness or contempt. Come on, now this is relevant, ain't it? 
How are we doing as a country? When we as a people, big picture, experience conflict and adversity, are we a people of kindness or are we a people of contempt? Let's tighten the focus. One person's listening. Let's tighten the focus. How are we doing as a church? Autumn Ridge Church, the people of Autumn Ridge Church, when we intersect with conflict, when we intersect with adversity, are we people of kindness or are we people of contempt? Let's tighten the focus even more. How's your marriage? When you intersect with conflict, when you intersect with adversity, which best describes you? Which best describes the kind of response that comes out of you? Kindness or contempt? Now, I'm not smart enough to explain why this is so easy. I'm not smart enough to explain why contempt is so attractive and why sometimes it's just kind of emotionally gratifying to let contempt fly out of our mouths. I can't explain why. I just know that it is. And maybe that's why Proverbs gives us so many warnings about contempt. Here's a few. Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter. Just drop it before a dispute breaks out. It is to one's honor to avoid strife, but every fool is quick to quarrel. What are you quick to do? Quick to fight or quick to avoid a fight? Whoever loves a quarrel, whoever loves griping, complaining, arguing, drama, whoever loves it, loves missing the mark. Whoever builds a high gate invites destruction. Can I ask you a personal question? Okay, I'm going to do it anyway. When you're squeezed by conflict and when you're squeezed by adversity, what comes out of you? Does it look like kindness or does it look like contempt? I'm going to keep it real with you. I got squeezed this week. And sometimes kindness came out. Sometimes it didn't. This week I had to go back and apologize to some people and just say, I, I, respond, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? Do you remember how we're describing wisdom? you remember how we're defining it? We're calling it the art of adulting. This really is the definition of what comes from the Hebrew word hokama, which means wisdom. And this is what it is. It's to understand and skillfully engage with the full spectrum of reality. This is a mature, grown-up life of thriving for which God designed you and me. If we're going to skillfully engage, we got to understand. What do we got to understand? We got to understand this so we can avoid this. So in all the unpredictable uh, situations of life and all of our interpersonal interactions, we know how to skillfully engage and respond with this. Kindness or contempt. This is what Proverbs has been saying from the beginning. And believe it or not, when researchers, and marriage experts study marriage, the kind of conclusions they come to align perfectly with what we read in God's word. Have you ever heard of the Gottmans, John and Julie Gottman? They're world-renowned marriage experts. They're clinical psychologists. For 40 years, John Gottman has been studying what makes a happy couple a happy couple and what makes a miserable couple a miserable couple. 40 years, he studied over 2,000 couples. And he's gotten to the point to where he can meet a brand new couple, spend two days with them, and predict with 94% accuracy whether or not that couple will make it. He can predict with 94% accuracy whether that couple will thrive or shrivel in misery. What does he know? What does he understand? Let me tell you, 40 years of research, everything that he says it's exactly what we've been reading in Proverbs from the beginning. And when we discover that a scientist or researcher or an expert produces findings that align with God's word, we shouldn't be surprised. As a matter of fact, Proverbs predicts it. Proverbs 25 too. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search out a matter is the glory of kings. Research, study, discovery. It is magisterial. And the more we Engage. the more we study, the more we learn about reality, the more we see God's fingerprints on the fabric of life. In the same way that the heavens declare the glory of God, in the same way that archaeological discoveries continue to affirm the biblical narrative, in the exact same way when scientists and philosophers and historians 
and researchers produce findings that match what we read in God's word, it celebrates the wisdom of God. I think that should produce one of two responses. If you're not a follower of Jesus, I think it should woo you to trust him in his word. If you are a follower of Jesus, I think it should inspire you to worship and to be grateful for his word. All right, I don't want to bury the lead. What did John Gottman discover after 40 years of research? What is it that causes couples to thrive? It is not sexual chemistry. It is not the dimensions of compatibility. It is not being really, really good looking. It comes down to one thing, one thing only. Couples who are kind thrive. Couples who aren't don't. Couples who are kind have deep, thriving, beautiful marriages. Couples who are not kind shrivel in misery. He can spend two days with a couple and just watching the little subtle interactions can predict with 94% accuracy whether or not they'll make it, whether or not they'll thrive. His research has been summarized like this. Contempt is the number one factor that tears couples apart. People who are focused on criticizing their partners miss a whopping 50% of positive things their partners are doing and they see negativity when it's not there. If you get into a pattern of griping and complaining, you will miss half of the good things someone is doing. And you will see negative things when they don't even exist. Just for funsies. Do you think that's only true in marriage? Or do you think that's true every time we gripe and complain? There we go. You think it's true that, I mean, regardless of what it is, regardless of what the context is, regardless of the kind of relationship, when we find ourselves in a pattern of griping and complaining, we miss 50% of the good stuff. And we see negative stuff that doesn't even exist. People who give their partner the cold shoulder, deliberately ignoring the partner or responding minimally. Notice he's talking about, it's not just active meanness, it's just acting uninterested when there's something that's interesting to your spouse. What does stuff like that do? They damage the relationship by making their partner feel worthless and invisible as if they're not there, not valued. And people who treat their partners with contempt and criticize them not only kill the love in the relationship, but they also kill. They also kill their partner's ability to fight off viruses and cancers. Being mean is the death knell of relationships. Kindness or contempt? It's as simple as that. Which one are you going to choose? Which kind of person are we going to be? Let me tell you something I know about you even if I don't know you. Because this is probably true of all of us. When you respond in a way that's not kind, it's because you think the other person doesn't deserve it. Well, if they would just, I'd be kind. If they would just stop, I'd be kind. I get it. But Proverbs is pushing us to pre-decide. That we pre-decide whether or not we're going with kindness or contempt. Not let the other person determine whether or not we're going with kindness or contempt. You know how Proverbs talks about it? This is how Proverbs talks about it. A person's wisdom yields patience. It's to one's glory to overlook an offense. I got to tell you, I was not looking forward to giving this message this week. It's been whooping me all week, and I'm just inviting you in. Not to mention, I'm like talking about it out loud publicly in front of my wife, and so I'm going to be like expected to act on this now. <laughs> and this word right here, man, it's a powerful word. And I want to talk about this word, but I'm afraid if we talk about it, you're going to get mad at me. Do you promise not to get mad at me? All right. This is what patience means. We're going to, we're going to let the Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible help us. And it's a synopsis of what patience means biblically. It's the ability to take a great deal of punishment from evil people. We're not necessarily saying your spouse is evil. A great deal of punishment from people or circumstances without losing one's temper, without becoming irritated or angry, or without taking vengeance, it continues. 
It includes the capacity to bear pain or trials without complaint, the ability to forbear under severe provocation, and the self-control which keeps one from acting rashly even though suffering opposition or adversity. Have you ever just wanted to walk out on a church service? Like, I want to walk out on my own sermon right now. This is hard. But this is chesed. This is the way Jesus loves us. It's the way he is happy to respond to us. And when you know him, and when you've been loved by him, it changes you from the inside out and you want to love other people that way too. Did you notice what the immediate application of being patient is? Wisdom yields patience. It's to one's glory to overlook an offense. How glorious are you? If someone was writing a biography of your life and they had complete access to you, what would the story of you have to say about this? Are you quick and eager to point out a fault and flaw? Are you quick to pass over it? Now, it's probably worth noting that um, for something to be offensive doesn't mean that it's a matter of right or wrong. I mean, we get offended about things that have nothing to do with violating moral boundaries all the time. Like I'm offended by the way my wife uses the remote. I really think the proper care and handling of a remote should be included in premarital counseling. Okay? All right, but this is a lean in moment, right? This is a lean in moment. probably the majority of things that offend us have nothing to do with right or wrong. They have nothing to do with anything moral. Probably the majority of things that offend us violate our preferences. They collide with our preferences. They contradict our preferences. Come on now. Who's ever gotten mad at somebody for breathing too loud? Like they're just trying to stay alive and we're like, could you stop? Anybody ever have a fight over how to load the dishwasher? Okay, all right. Listen, let me ask you this. What's your glory quotient? If Jesus is saying to us through his word, you are glorious when you overlook an offense. You shine brightest when you overlook an offense. Here's a serious question. What causes you to lose your luster with your spouse? And this verse doesn't mean that we don't have boundaries. This doesn't mean that we sometimes don't have to have hard conversations and talk to somebody about how their choices hurt us and impact us. But what this means is that because of the way that we've been loved, because we are wise, because we are patient, we have a disposition in which we are willing and happy to overlook something that offends us. Now, there's a natural question. It's my question. It might be your question too. How do you know when to overlook and when not to overlook an offense? Who thinks that's a good question? Who wants to know the answer to that question? All right, here we go. Don't get mad at me. I don't know. I don't know. Wisdom cannot be reduced to rules. Wisdom cannot be reduced to a formula. There is not an ironclad, airtight answer. This is the best I can give you. If overlooking an offense does not bring harm to that person or to others, why wouldn't we? If overlooking an offense does not bring harm to that person or to others, why wouldn't we? It was a little over 10 years ago. I just moved to a new city, a big city, Salt Lake City. And uh, we still didn't know where a lot of stuff was. I knew where my house was. I knew where my job was. That's basically all I knew. And uh, one afternoon, one Sunday afternoon, I had this crazy pain start shooting in my back and I knew exactly what was happening. I was about to pass a kidney stone. Have you ever been in so much pain that your body is spasming and you can't control it? I'm just like break dancing in the front seat of the car, you know, in pain, agonizing as my wife throws the kids in the back seat and she tries to drive us to an ER of which we have no idea where one is. And so she looks it up on her phone, punches it into Google Maps, and it takes us to the middle of this neighborhood where there is no ER to be found, right? And so she's just like, I don't know where to go. And I'm like, just drive. And so she just starts making turns, hoping we accidentally find one. Meanwhile, I feel like I'm about to give birth to an angry porcupine. And, and I'm loud, 
and I'm aggressive and my kids who are eight and five are sitting in the back seat. I'm using really colorful language and they are learning brand new vocabulary. And to my wife's glory, she was simultaneously compassionate and helped my kids laugh off all the silly things dad is saying right now. In extreme moments, in extreme moments, we know intuitively how to overlook an offense. But what about the everyday moments? Heather and I were talking about this this week. This is where we landed. You just got to know your spouse. You have to understand them so that you can respond to what they need. I really hope this is encouraging. You don't have to be an expert on marriage. Become an expert on your spouse. To do the work, to get to know them and to know what they need in the moment because you love them. I heard someone say one time that kindness is love with work boots on. Are you willing to put them on and lace them up? Are you willing to do the work necessary to love your spouse and to give them kindness? Not because they deserve it, but because they need it. A couple who does this, a person who decides to do this, it's intentional, it's on purpose. It's someone who decides whenever we intersect with conflict or adversity, I'm gonna get shoulder to shoulder with you and we're gonna attack the problem together. I'm not gonna get face to face with you and attack you. We're gonna get shoulder to shoulder and attack the problem. We're not gonna get face to face and attack each other even if you're the reason we're in the middle of this. That's what it means to pre-decide to opt for kindness. I want you to imagine this scenario. It's a summer evening. You've got the grill out on the driveway. All the food is cooking on the grill. And maybe somebody forgot to clean the grease trap for a few months on the grill. And somehow the grill just catches on fire. It's like blazing and black smoke is billowing at the exact same time that neighbors knock on the front door because you've invited them over for dinner. This may or may not have happened to Heather and me. What do you do in that scenario? Do you respond as teammates with kindness? Or do you unleash some contempt to protect your ego and your sense of superiority? If your marriage is happy, it's not the absence of problems. Credit goes to the presence of kindness. If your marriage is anywhere less than happy, it's not the presence of problems. It's the absence of kindness. Will you up the kindness quotient? Even if you don't know how your spouse is going to respond, even without knowing how they're going to respond to this, would you just pre-decide, no matter what, I'm opting for kindness. I'm binding this around my neck. I'm writing it on the tablet of my heart. I'm carving it on the core of who I am. This is not self-help. This is the gospel. The Apostle Paul said this to us, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering, a sacrifice to God, just as Christ loved us. This is not fake it till you make it because you can't share what you don't have. This kind of love, this kind of kindness does not come naturally and that's okay. It comes supernaturally. It comes after we humbly respond in repentance to Jesus. He loves us and changes us from the inside out and by his power and by his presence makes us able to do the same for others. And so this is my question. Are you remembering the gospel and are you applying the gospel to your marriage? This is what it looks like to forget the gospel. I was given this and yet I am giving this. This is what it looks like to remember the gospel. I deserve this. And yet I was given this. So let's end here. Love your spouse as you have been loved by your Savior. And we could all probably respond in one of three ways today. One way is you could say, Rick, I'm not perfect, but this is really what I'm trying to do. This is what we're trying to do. Be encouraged and reaffirm that direction. 
The other way to respond is to say, man, this is right and this is good, but I got off the track and I've been off the track for a while. I'm not doing this. But your response is to repent, is to say to Jesus, I violated your love. I'm not loving the way I have been loved. It's to say to your spouse, it's to say to the other person, I violated my promise to you. I haven't been loving you the way that I love and I'm turning away from that. And I'm deciding right now, no matter what comes, I choose kindness. Third way, it might be the realization. I think all of this is good and I've even been trying it, but I've never received Jesus' love for me. I've heard people talk about it. I've been around it. Maybe I've even sung the songs. But I've never in humility and repentance come to Jesus. And so Jesus, I believe in what you did on the cross and the resurrection. I accept your forgiveness. Would you accept me? I want your love. That's how you enter in. And so right now I'm just gonna pray and we invite you to respond in whichever way is best for you. You pray with me. Heavenly Father, you are gentle, you are kind, you are generous. You give good things that we could never deserve and we are grateful. It is amazing to think that you think of us as glorious when we choose to love the way we've been loved, when we choose to be patient and overlook offenses. Help us to trust you and to remember that this comes only by you. And it is in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.